Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Centers. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can remain independent and better connected with family and friends. The reason I'm so passionate about helping patients with hearing loss is because I lost my brother Robbie twice. First, a hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then when he passed away. I'm an ear, nose, and throat that only cares for ears. I'm the E of ENT. I performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and taken care of many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers, and I'm also the author of a book, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, we have a returning guest. Um, it's the hearing challenge coach, Cheryl Nolte. Um, she specializes in helping people of hearing challenges to fully enjoy life and wanted to be us to be aware about assisted li- listening devices or ALDs. And so we're going to uh, explore this, this topic. And uh, she's got a great uh, amount of information about this to share with our listeners. So Cheryl, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, what does a, a assisted li- listening device mean? In other words, when people talk about ALDs, what is an ALD? An ALD is uh, a device that was created to help people hear in circumstances um, where it's it's a something that you don't have to put in your ear. And it helps with the sound, the amplification. Uh, there's several different ways to approach the use of the ALD, and some of them are what I consider pretty vital. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the different types of categories. What are the different categories of assisted listen- listening devices, Cheryl? Well, you have the... Uh, the type of device that uh, is for alerting. Okay. So, could be where your doorbell is ringing, or it could be a smoke alarm. Um, you have the device that is used to help you listen to TV without the sound being so loud that it affects your pets or your spouse or someone else in the room. Okay. You have a device that works with your phone or to bring in the phone call with captioning um, or just to simply amplify the sound and perhaps cut out the noise. You have devices that are specifically created for use in a group setting, whether it be in a small restaurant or whether it be in a a larger setting like uh, uh, a meeting per se. You have the in-person devices that are uh, something that I like particularly, like ones that are created to work with your hearing aid, or there's three formats of use that are created uh, to help you get sound when you're not getting it. Um, Then you have uh, the ones that are created to help you improve your music listening which uh, a lot of people really like the idea of. And um, then there are those that are created for the large venues, like a a theater or a play or a classroom or an auditorium. So the first category, if I recollect correctly on your list, was alarm devices. So things that tell you if there's a fire or, excuse me, or um, the doorbell's ringing. I believe also... um, if you're here, if you're having problems with your hearing, obviously a traditional waking up alarm doesn't work as well. So, um, wh- can you describe how these devices work or what they do? Yes, uh, the two of them I consider vital. One is your alerting for uh, smoke, um, and they have now where actually there's some grants with fire departments where you can get these free. They do work with electric and. They have strobe lights, and they have very, very loud, profoundly loud sound that go with them. So if you normally can't hear a sound, I have two in my house. Um, If you normally can't hear a sound with your hearing aids off, if you're sleeping or whatever, they will be so loud, your next door neighbor can almost hear it, and they will also have these strobe lights flashing that you can see almost throughout the house. And uh, I consider those pretty vital. There is the one that will tell you when the doorbell's ringing. 
um, or if there's a loud sound at the at the door, that type of thing. How does that and alert you? Then, how does that alert you? So if somebody rings the door. How does it tell you if somebody's hearing a pair? Well, there's more than one way that it happens. It can alert you through a uh, a vibration technique. It depends upon the device itself. Um, some of them actually work with your smartphone. There are some that work with light flashing to let you know that there's a specific uh, thing different from the fire going <laughs> that uh, will tell you that your your doorbell is ringing or something's happening at your front door. I consider it um, the non-canine way <laughs> of alerting you that something's going on there that you need to pay attention to. And if someone is trying to tell you, like my next door neighbor would try to tell me if there's a uh, something special going on in the neighborhood, he tried pounding at my door and I have mixed hearing loss, so I don't hear much in the way of vibration or with sound. Um, and I didn't have my hearing aids on, so I could not tell he was pounding. He sent me a text and that's how I found out what was going on. But uh, for something with a, f a fire or uh, someone ringing the bell, then um, there, are, there are different ways that, of alerting you. It depends upon the device itself but to the method that's used that you like the best. Right. And yeah. if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, for new they, they have alarms in your pillows, right, that vibrate? Yes. Yes. There are uh, wake-up alarms. There are alarms that you can take with you when you go to sleep to tell you when certain things are going on. And some of those are like the, there's one called the bed shaker. <laughs> and there's actually alarms that you can wear on your wrist that will vibrate and let you know when something is going on and get you awake without even having to worry about sound. Okay. And so that was the first category. I wish you, you, it was an extensive list. So what was the next category on the list for, for Cheryl? Uh, the next category on the list was the uh, Timmy. So, devices. so these are typically infrared devices, is that correct? Or some sort of, or Bluetooth that goes to hearing aids or something? Yeah, they can, the Bluetooth is the newest version that, that it works with. There are, uh, they keep coming out with new technology and new ways of, of working with hearing your TV without having to turn the sound up so much that it affects even, even pets lose hearing loss because sound is too loud. So um, I always suggest that you find a way to use your television or if you're listening to video, there are, there are ways to do that as well through your compact system for uh, DVDs and, and that type of thing to keep the sound at a level you can understand through one method or another without hurting the rest of the household. Or closed captioning, correct? Yes. Captioning is, is uh, improving all the time and we must release of the um, FCC and the um, 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. It's a long <laughs> term. I had to look at actually what that is, but it does increase the role for requiring captioning on more, uh, on more devices than were required before. And the ability of the captioner has improved because it's become much more prevalent for your broadcast stations and your your other venues that would use this type of transmittal to you to have captioning that is worthwhile and makes sense and it comes out actually quicker than it used to as well they've improved the transmittability of the captions yeah uh, i uh when i'm working out i use closed caption and you can tell sometimes they're doing well and sometimes they stumble and aren't keeping up. But uh, by and large, you can really get the gist of what's going on without having to hear it. Um, so I, I think it's very effective. One of the things is just a comment for um, listeners is many people who use these devices will say, well, I can hear the TV much more than I can hear everybody else. And the reason is, is, is because essentially the space between the TV and the speaker, if you have hearing aids, is being eliminated. And so it's going right into your ear from the TV. And then you say, well, I can't hear my spouse as well. Well, the reality is, is that your spouse's voice is not going right into your ear. It still has to go across the room 
and there's ambient noise and other things that interfere with that that sound and so that's why you know tv ears or whatever you use those types of things are are highly effective but they're obviously not a substitute for rehabilitating your hearing loss because frankly when you have them on you can't talk to anybody which isn't wrong but you know there are so many other times you need to hear so that's great what's the next uh, category um sure uh, um the various devices that are out there to help you when you need to make a phone call and yeah, of course so the smartphone has many types and those get more into the apps category that we talked about but there are home phone devices there are uh three primary uh companies that provide phones they can get that you can get for your home with captioning right. on your calls there are bridges that can translate or take what is received on your cell phone and put it into your home phone so that the captions from what was said on your phone at the time you weren't home can come into your home phone and you can read it later on your home phone that i find that very interesting oh that's great and uh the they not only do that but they offer you some pitch and frequency uh tuning abilities and they uh also, of course, increase your volume as you need. There's a control for that as well. And yeah, I mean, I think that they work really well. Some work both either with computer or landline. Some work just strictly with computer now. Well, some of the transcription applications for voicemails are pretty, pretty amazing at this point. Um, certainly, um, I, I would expect most people would just use their cell phone as their answering machine because your cell phone will transcribe uh, the call. The other comment I'd make for uh, listeners is if you've ever done the difference, so for Apple, it's called uh, FaceTime. So you can do non-video FaceTime calls. And so that is a call over the internet. And that actually is easier for you to hear than a typical cellular phone call. And the reason is, is when you send the information over the internet, it doesn't get parsed down to a small amount of information. The way that cell phones work and landlines work is they kind of parse out some of the uh, sound to make it so it can go over wires and can go over cell towers. And so when you use the internet, it's easier for people to understand. So what's the next category, Cheryl? Um, we talk about the devices that you use for uh, in group setting. And so these are actually, microphones? Microphones? Uh, yes, they're... they're uh, devices, some of them are more complex than others, but they're devices that really capture the sound. getting back to the concept with the TV, you get a better signal because the microphone is closer to the speaker and you don't get some of the degradation across the room and ambient noise and things like that. And so, you know, for people who have problems in meetings, these are really uh, a, a real booster in terms of people's ability to function. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that about the microphone because not everyone is aware. They think that a microphone is going to pick up everything everywhere. And there are some microphones that are specifically created to pick up what's in front of you as opposed to what's behind you in right. a way of trying to keep it out of noise. So it's always good, no matter what the device is you're looking for, is to find out what that microphone will do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's a um, 
frankly, a world of specs that I don't totally understand uh, about microphones, but uh, we'll leave it at that. And so what's the next category, Cheryl? Uh, we have the in-person type of discussion when you're talking, and actually the, the pen can also work with that sure. if you are close enough to the person. The, the rule of thumb is if you have to speak louder with someone who is only three feet away, there is a hearing difficulty there to be addressed. And so if your your normal space of three feet between people is good for communicating, but if you have difficulty hearing someone within that area or even a little bit beyond that area, there are devices that will help you do that besides just the hearing aid or a cochlear implant. Uh, or an iPad, actually. And some of those are very interesting. I find the hearables the newest category that intrigues me in that regard. And a lot, you'll see a lot of people wearing the white little <laughs> devices hanging from their ears. Um, you'll see the uh, Roger Pen that you mentioned is possible for that, for the in person type. Sometimes I just use my cell phone. And, or as uh, a microphone, right? In other yeah, words, yes, connected, yes, right? yes. And there's, there's, uh, it seems to be new things coming out all the time. Even some people like to talk, believe it or not, when they're both wearing the same kind of headphone <laughs> to each other. And one of the things that I like to point out is when that happens, you can think about the on the football field where the coach is talking to somebody out there. This is new technology they've been using for right. a little while. But uh, it's really neat that they can do that. They find themselves not just speaking the words because someone else might be able to read the list. Yeah, they <laughs> cover it up with their play with their play sheet, right? The ones that are careful they, they put it in front because they don't up, yeah. actually they don't want the somebody with the right. microphone in it. Yeah. <laughs> So I find that a lot of fun to talk about. The men really like to get into that. <laughs> the next category, actually, doctor, is uh, the, the larger venues. And a lot of people aren't aware that uh, you can go to a museum, you can go to a play, you can go to a theater, and there are things provided, required to be provided to for a certain percentage. I believe it's now 4% of their attendees. Right. They must at least offer the devices too, but some of them actually offer looping as well, which is what works with the T-coil in the hearing aids or the cochlear implant. And that is taking off in South Florida. I don't know about in Arizona per se so much, but in South Florida, a lot more venues are getting, getting looped. And if you go to Europe, Europe is way ahead of us as far as looping goes. Yeah. Um, so we had a guest on about looping. And so what I would say is, is, is um, new build is easier than retrofit, right? So uh, when they build it into a building, it's a lot easier than uh, putting it in a, in a existing building. But yes, I think there's a big movement to that. Um, you know, uh, people want it in their churches, uh, in their uh, public meeting spaces and things like that, which seems to be more prominent in speaking venues as compared to musical venues, it seems, um, and movie venues seem to use more infrared. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but that that's what my experience seems. It seems like the theaters and the symphony halls and stuff use infrared um, uh, headsets more so than they do loops. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they are looking at several factors. One, of course, that you mentioned, the infrared uh, that works with lighting is, is um, probably one that has technology that's been out there so long that the devices are actually cheaper for them to use and multiply within the venue to offer. Right. Uh, looping is better if you do it before you build. <laughs> yes, yes <laughs> that's what I say. Retrofit's really expensive. Around the ceiling. And uh, so that that's uh, why not very many of them necessarily use looping. I know in Vero Beach, uh, just north of me, the museum, the art museum is actually looped. Yeah, I think the other issue is is there are people who are hearing impaired who are not wearing hearing technology. And so the infrared can compensate for that, but looping assumes you have hearing aids. Well, it does to a certain point. Now they have where they actually have the neck loops that um, are created to Receive. work with people who do not have hearing aids. Okay. 
No, that's great. Yeah. That, that I think was one of the different. <laughs> right. So, all right. That, that's great to know. And so you can actually call a venue ahead of time and find out uh, okay. what there is. I mean, you know, one of the big complaints of people as they have a progressive hearing loss is like, I, I don't enjoy movies. I don't enjoy live performances. Um, a lot of them say, I don't enjoy going to uh, worship services because they're they're missing out and so you can call ahead of time and certainly i do know i have multiple patients who have advocated within their own uh, worship community their own religious community to mm -hmm. get some sort of uh, adaptation because frankly only so many people can sit in the front row to be able to see the preachers you know see the uh, celebrants uh, face and so there are other ways to compensate for that hearing impairment yeah and um in addition to uh, and as advocates both you and i would in 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 Italy tell people to speak for yourself and don't hide the, anything about your hearing loss as a secret um, right don't pretend let them know you need help because most people really want to help they no that's true so I, 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 that I learned that early in my career when right. a woman when I had a patient came in who, who had a tag that said my name's such and such I'm I'm hard of hearing uh, she she basically truly wore it on her chest uh, to let people That's, know. So. Yeah, I give one of those to my all of my lip reading students. I send it with a certificate of completion. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and I talk about how great they are. They save a lot of hassle. That's one thing that uh, my favorite benefit is that it saves the hassle of having to ask someone, what did you say? Or right. They know already. Right. They're going right. to. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. what other categories are there? Uh, there are certain certain devices as well as apps that are created to be better for music surroundings, and some of the hearables and the headphones definitely fall into that category. There's like ten categories of headphones to get into. With all the new developments, they're finding now that the musicians are finally protecting their hearing yeah. and wearing devices to help them hear what they need to hear but not pick up all the loudness of everything around them so that they don't lose more hearing. And I think I wish more people would consider doing that as well if they go to a concert or go to a venue where they need to do something, look into the possible devices. They don't all have to be expensive to uh, accommodate their hearing situation. Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, one of the resistances, unfortunately, um, for hearing protection, it's not the necessarily right, is is many of the kind of off-the-shelf devices um, attenuate or decrease the low frequencies more than they do the high frequencies. And so the music doesn't sound the same, if that makes sense. So they take yeah, away right. a lot of that. And so unfortunately, if you want something that makes all of, makes it, passes it through, but attenuates it, meaning lowers the volume, but presents it around the same, there are what are called musician plugs, uh, and but that is a certain takes a certain amount of investment because they have specialized technology and filters in them. But I, I agree with you, and if you're a big concert goer, I would certainly uh, recommend that to people. Yep, that would be good. Um, I and I I think pointing out, like you talked about, people with or without hearing aids, is the fact that um, assistive listening devices are regulated. And they fall under these acts, uh, the new 21st Century Communications and Video Act. They are, you will find the FDA and the FCC involved in what they are required to do and not do. And uh, the difference between them and many of the over-the-counter hearing aids is many of those were not regulated when they came out. And they yeah. actually... By your definition, yeah. the uh, over-the-counter hearing aids go in your ear and an assisted listen listening device or a PSAP yeah. another device is not because it goes in your ear. So it, it, they are definitely devices to help you to hear better, but they don't fall in the category of an assisted listening device. Yes, they're, right. they're actually LDs, listening devices, I guess, is what you would say, perhaps. Right, right. Some people think about the one being the same, which one should I use or what do I need to have? And, and with the less expensive uh, OTC hearing aids out there, they think that they can supplant the one with the other and it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> well, 
Well, I think people have to think of this, um, you know, like a toolbox, right? In other words, you know, not everything, you know, if you have a toolbox and all it has is a hammer, you're not going to probably get the job done. I mean, you know, you need a, a variation of tools. And so you have to think of, okay, what are the listening environments I go into where I struggle and are there ways to make it better? And so you're right. And that's actually something people have to understand even if you pursue hearing technology to treat your hearing loss, if you get hearing aids to treat your hearing loss, it doesn't mean that it's going to solve all of the problems. You know, one of the things I think also like, so as you know, as well as I do, Cheryl, the biggest complaint oftentimes is I can't hear well in restaurants. And, you know, the one thing that is hard sometimes for people to realize is normal individuals have problems hearing in restaurants. And so then you add on to your hearing impairment and it makes it substantially worse. But there are ways to improve that as well, you know, by having a microphone that could be at the table or a pen or a, a mobile mic that could be passed around. I know I have uh, many uh, patients whose spouses have a microphone around their neck, um, so that so that you know when they're you know rattling around the house, um, you know that takes care of, that helps improve some of the frustrations of communication on both of their parts. So it's really realizing where you're having a problem and how can you enhance it. Yes, I agree with you very much. Uh, not everyone understands how acoustics of the venue or wherever you happen to be plays in so much, along with just the noise ratio that might be out there. And um, that, in addition to being able to focus on what you want to do with the person you're listening to, it, there's so many distractions out there. Yeah. And, and like I said, for normal hearing individuals, a lot of distractions, let alone for people who are trying to get, you know, I mean, what you're essentially trying to do, there's a lot of information in the environment you're in, and there's certain information you're trying to pick up. And so how do you make it so that information is more presentable to you than the other information? Right. 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 So, well, this has been a great overview. And so uh, I, when we were talking before, there are some that you've used. Uh, can you share some of your experience with some of these in terms of how it helps you and what it doesn't do if there are limitations? I mean, I think it'd be great for the listeners to know, not just, you know, to look at these, but also, you know, reality, like being realistic. Somebody who has a big experience with hearing loss and sounds like, you know, you've tried all this stuff. You have kind of a pretty good take on all of it. Well, the... Um first experience that I'll talk about is the many of the hearing aid manufacturers make a microphone, a portable microphone that you can get to work with your hearing aids and put it like on the podium or somewhere near wherever a speaker is for a certain uh, presentation that you want to listen to. And that microphone has a certain distance requirement. So you want to make sure that you're observing that when you place it. I always suggest that you put your little mailing label or something on there so you don't, even if you have the same type as someone else, you get yours back. <laughs> and um, they can work very well. You want to make sure to, if you're going to go somewhere where that might come in handy, protect it from the cold and the heat, take the charging device for it with you so that you can charge it up because they only work so long before they need charging again. And they actually work, most of them, from my experience with the different students that I've had and the different clients that I've had, really work pretty well with the hearing aids that they get. They actually really, really like them. So uh, I think that that is great that those different ones work that way. But there are some out there also that work with any hearing aid and some that just work. Even if you don't wear a hearing aid, there's certain microphone things that you can use. I have something called a Quattro uh, that I got, oh, gee, I think in 2014 I got it. And they had been out for a little while, and I still use it. And it is more for group setting type sure. of uh, event. And um, it picks up the sound, but it, it's made, it doesn't pick up all the noise going around, which I really like. And it helps me hear anyone that might be sitting at this large table or, or whatever with me. And I like that. And I also have something called the Comfort uh, Duet, which is smaller and a little more portable. And they all require charging devices. So be sure right. that you are aware of that. And they each have their pluses and minuses. But those are some that I've had good experience with. There are yes. many of them out there. 
So I'll just give you a little story. So when I give talks on cochlear implants, I mean, one of the big strategies for hearing impaired people is to arrive early and get in the front seat, front row, right? Yes. That's, that's what people do. Here's the thing. Yes. When you fill a room with a bunch of people who are interested in cochlear implants, there are only so many seats in the front. And so, mm -hmm. and, and what I will tell you is, is everybody's there 15 minutes early because they're all trying to do... <laughs> the same thing. And that's why having the microphone that you can put up on the podium is very helpful because, you know, not everybody's going to get that front seat. And I mean, I totally get the strategy to be able to lip read and not have noise and people and heads in the way and all of those things that can happen. But it's kind of interesting if everybody has a hearing impairment, then there are only so many seats in the front. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And I found that more and more as time goes on, there are more and more people using the smaller mic. That's why I, I say be sure you get your label or, you know, engrave sure. your initials or something on there so you know yours is yours. Because there's more than one. <laughs> there were five one time when I went of the same exact kind. Right, right. <laughs> Sitting up there by the, by the podium on the table. I thought that was so interesting. So any any uh, parting words in terms of people and, you know, what they should do? I think they, it sounds like they really need to talk to their hearing care provider about, you know, are there ways I can improve or even keeping a journal about where they're having problems so you can have an in-depth discussion of how you can make it better? I think the journal is a, is a huge idea that's important for people with hearing trouble because they will forget when they go back in to mention something that they wanted to mention. They just didn't write it down. If you keep a journal of those things and when they happen, and sometimes the timeline makes a difference. How long before that were you exposed to noise? How long before that uh, did you were you sleep deprived? Uh, what kind of stress were you were under? It's almost like my tinnitus journal that I give to my clients for tinnitus. Uh, but it, it relates to your hearing challenge as well. It took me two years to find out what started, what triggered my tinnitus. And then I found out I had more than one trigger. <laughs> Right. Well, but I mean, when they're in yeah. trouble. You want to know where some people are impacted by noise more than others. Correct. And they get to discuss that with the doctor and hyperacusis, that noise sensitivity is, is important for the doctor to know. Well, I think the answer is, is, is there's not one single flavor of hearing loss and people have to right. understand that it's multifactorial and you know, it, it can't just be, well, you know, I talked to my neighbor, they had hearing loss and they did this and this is what worked. It, it just, it just doesn't work that way. And that's why you need an assessment and a customized care. So Cheryl, this has been great. If people, I know that this is part of your uh, course where that you teach people in your uh, lip reading and hearing uh, course. Um, uh, if people wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Uh, they go to my website, w www.hearingchallengecoach.com and uh, they could also email speechreader2 and that's a number 2 at gmail.com Well this has been great this is Cheryl Nolte she's a multi-time guest she's been sharing a lot of her wisdom about hearing loss and dealing with hearing loss um, she's got a lot of personal experience which I think is wonderful that she's willing to share and you know look I mean you know if you don't know it you know Cheryl has a hearing impairment she's on zoom doing great totally understanding what's going on and so you know she's a testament of how functional you can be if your hearing loss is appropriately addressed and treated thank Cheryl, you Dr. Pim. thank you so much for coming on this has been great thank you Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.